So in this presentation, I just uh, tell the story of the module uh, from the original ID right to the moment it's put to market and then released. So we'll first uh, talk about my uh, inspiration, uh, what motivates me to uh, create such or such module. And well, the first thing is that there is no uh, market research. It's really just a scratching my own uh, itches. Um, it's not like I ask people uh, what kind of modules would you like to see. It's really just my very selfish uh, uh, motivations and intuitions. Um, and uh, one idea uh, you see uh, a lot in my product is the idea of uh, continuity or uh, finding uh, in between what is in between existing states. So for example, for stages, you know the uh, envelopes, you know the sequencer, and my approach is to ask the question, is there something in between and uh, what can it be? And you also see it um, in the evolution between uh, braids and plaits, uh, in which I try to uh, group together um, distinct models from braids into one uh, single model in plaits. So I, uh, and obviously, uh, this picture is from uh, elements. So uh, if you look at um, physical modeling software, um, like VST, uh, you, are, you often see this uh, combo box in which you can select a material, like you have one option for wood, one option for metal. And uh, during my uh, design process for elements, I wanted all the parameters to be uh, continuous. I did not want to have any uh, switch or any uh, button just going from setting one, setting two, setting three. So I'm trying to focus on uh, signal processes operation that are continuously variable from one state uh, to the other. And um, this is something you find uh, really everywhere in my products. Um, then, so this guy is uh, Keith Barr, the founder of uh, Alesis. Um, if you, if you look at uh, product uh, documentation from other brands, uh, sometimes you see this line, like, no expense spared. Like, we use the most expensive converters, we use the most expensive uh, knobs, we use the most uh, precise circuit. And this is cool, uh, but to me this is not engineering. Uh, true engineering that you in is when you have to uh, struggle with limitation when you have to struggle with uh, constraint because you want to make things uh, affordable or you want to make things uh, small and in particular um, before uh, Alesis released the MIDI verb uh, reverb units were costing thousands of dollars and he came up with a reverb unit uh, which costed only uh, several hundreds dollars and there are many uh, shortcuts, optimization, tricks uh, in the first reverse from Alesis. But this is what gives them a very unique sound. And uh, similarly, in my products, there are often uh, shortcuts, uh, optimization, little tricks like that. Uh, as a result, the products are not perfect, but this is what gives them uh, texture. This is what makes the sound a bit uh, different from what you would get with uh, infinite or very high uh, computational power. So in terms of uh, constraints, um, do you know these guys? Any of you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, is uh, George Perec is a French writer uh, who has published, for example, a novel without using uh, the letter E. Um, so it's like the king of constraints. Um, on my side, I have uh, more reasonable uh, constraints, but this is things I have to keep in mind when I develop a product. The first one is the number of uh, instructions uh, per second my processor can do. So uh, with the processor I can uh, use now, uh, I know that to compute one single sample of sound, I can do up to uh, about uh, 2,000 uh, additions or multiplication. But uh, when I come up with a module idea, I keep this constraint in mind. So I, have, I can do 
absolutely anything because I have to fit with this uh, computational budget. Uh, the second constraint is um, absolutely anything I design, I have to sell, to sell at least uh, 250 units of it to get back my um, development costs. So uh, if someone uh, tells me, why aren't you making this completely crazy uh, module? Uh, well, it's easy because uh, this completely crazy module, only 50 people would be interested in it, and then I won't be able to uh, get back my uh, development cost. And the last constraint is the number of HP, the width of the module. So there is this kind of race to the bottom at the moment to uh, reduce uh, the um, width of the module. Um, in my case, I have this uh, simple rule. I take this finger, and I just need to be able to uh, run it between the knobs. So I won't make a module smaller if I'm violating this rule. Um, the last one, so I'm not sure any of you will recognize this guy. So uh, is uh, Ray Solomonov, um, is a mathematician who came up with the idea of um, um, uh, complexity, he, he mixed uh, complexity theory and information theory. Uh, what this means that he came up with this idea, uh, the question is how do you define mathematically whether something is simple or complex? And he had this brilliant idea to say, okay, I will create a computer program that describes the thing, and if the computer program is short, the thing is simple, and if uh, this computer program is complicated, it means that the thing is complicated. It's a simple idea and it's brilliant, but uh, I'm very inspired by this um, link between uh, the complexity of something and the length of the code of the computer program, because um, if I came up with if I come up with a module ID and I need to write uh, ten thousand lines of code to implement this ID, it will mean that uh, this ID will be very complex, and you, uh, as a user, uh, it will be difficult for you to learn uh, what the module is doing. But if uh, what the module is doing fit in only 100 lines of code, it probably means that you uh, will be able to learn uh, what the module is doing and sort of uh, build in your brain your own little copy of the module to, uh, you know, I'm going to turn a knob, I know what's going to happen because in my mind I have this uh, little copy uh, of the module running in my brain. So uh, what this means that at the moment uh, I avoid uh, writing code uh, that is getting uh, too long. So maybe that's a way of saying I'm becoming uh, lazy, uh, lazier and lazier. But uh, for example, uh, if you look at the code for stages, uh, the logic for the different rules for the segment. It fits on uh, one page uh, on the uh, screen of my computer. So it's a good metric to say that, okay, if uh, the code is not that large, it means that people will be able to learn and understand what the module does. Okay, so uh, now about the R&D process. Mm. So I will split it in uh, two parts for the analog modules and the digital modules. So for analog modules, I'm still working with uh, the things uh, called breadboards. So you can uh, snap components into it. You can uh, put wires. It's uh, really easy to uh, quickly swap a component. Like I say, OK, uh, I want to try this circuit with a different resistor value. I just pull it and put another component in place. Um, the only danger is that sometimes uh, circuits can work on a breadboard, but then when you build it on a proper circuit board, it will stop working. So it's, uh, you have to keep this in mind when you develop. Uh, I also sometimes uh, use uh, simulation software, uh, LTSpice. Uh, again, sometimes um, the simulation will work, but then when I build the module, it won't work. So you have to keep in mind that, well, it's only a uh, simulation. An, ex an example of that is Trails. Uh, it's a module I have uh, never released. It's a um, function generator, a bit like the uh, make noise uh, function. 
uh, um, and I used a different circuit from the original uh, Serge circuit that absolutely everybody is using. This is also what you will find in the Befaco uh, homepage. Uh, I tried to come up with an original circuit to do that, uh, but it never worked. I mean, it worked nicely in simulation, but there were all kinds of quirks in the actual module. And since I did not want to um, uh, steal the original circuit from Serge, I just canceled the module. Uh, no, I'm, now I'm going to talk about the uh, prototyping process for digital modules. So there are really nice uh, prototyp prototyping environments like uh, Faust, Super Collider, Pure Data. Um, I've played with uh, all of them. Uh, so for example, uh, at some, uh, during its development, Clouds uh, was a Pure Data patch and uh, some models for PLATs were uh, developed in uh, super colliders. But uh, I've got back to uh, working with the command line uh, C++ tool. So what this means uh, for the people among you who are not programmers is that instead of uh, testing the module physically by turning a knob or uh, virtually by having a copy of the module showing on my screen and being able to turn the knob uh, on the screen of the mouse. Uh, when I develop a module, I create like uh, a test case. So I will say, for example, okay, the user is moving the knob from zero to maximum in five seconds, and then back to zero in five seconds, and then uh, the knob is the knob is uh, wiggled very fast. So I create uh, with programs all these different test cases, and I just listen in uh, an audio editor what is the result. And it sounds a bit strange, but it's really good to do uh, A-B tests. So for example, I want to compare two versions of the same synthesis algorithm. And obviously, if you just um, uh, listen version 1, version 2, hmm, version 2 is better, but maybe it's because I move the knob faster or slower and if you really want uh, really want uh, true uh, reproducibility uh, you can do it only with uh, this kind of tool so it's my preferred uh, development method now how, and how long does it take to develop uh, a module uh, I'm, I'm i'm getting back to to this later but it's uh, between the moment i have the first idea i usually have something working in two months what Again. Between the, the time I have the first ID and I have something working, like uh, something in my hands looking like the real module, it's usually two months. Two months, yeah. But yeah. the programming is most of the time. Sorry? The programming. Yeah, it's mostly programming because um, I don't have to work on the module. Actually, that's um, what this is what I'm explaining in this side. So when I have the ID, first I develop this. Uh, C++ command line tool. Then at some point I take a module I have released before and I just uh, modify its firmware to test my new code. Then I build a hardware prototype and then the code moves on to the uh, actual modules. And uh, so it's like a soul migrating from one body to another. And w what is really cool with this process is that usually the code I write, uh, it's very easy to move it from one platform to the other. And, it, and since it's open source, it usually means that uh, after I release the module, you will find it on the uh, Axolotl or in VCV Rack, on the uh, Critter in Guitary Organelle, or in uh, Odulus, which is an iPhone app, kind of uh, virtual uh, modular for the iPhone. And um, it's kind of easy for uh, DSP developers to take my code and just get it to run on another platform because it's already part of my job to uh, move it from one uh, incarnation to the next. Uh, and now we've, we're going to talk about user interface. So um, this picture are uh, what my first uh, modules, Braze, Ripple, and Frames, uh, what they would have looked like uh, if I had done the uh, design myself. <laughs> uh, so please, uh, there are people whose job is to draw, to make things beautiful, designers, illustrators, 
give some work to these people. <laughs> Um, so, um, I work with um, an Italian guy, uh, Hannes Pasqualini, uh, also uh, going by the username uh, Paper Noise. He's also doing illustration for uh, other uh, modular manufacturers now, but uh, I was the, um, like the first person to uh, spot his talent and is doing the uh, visual design for my brand. So, usually, uh, how does it go? So sometimes I just uh, draw a mock-up myself, as you can see on the left. Uh, sometimes I do it in uh, Photoshop, or sometimes I just send, in, uh, send him an email, hey, I have this module ID, uh, I just uh, want the module to have uh, two big knobs and three big knobs, uh, can you find uh, something? And uh, we go uh, back and forth uh, exchanging ide ideas, so you can see all the uh, different uh, uh, suggestion we had for the module uh, cloud or for PIX. <laughs> but uh, this is a two-way process. So uh, Hannes had this uh, word, he called the face of a module, because when you look at the knob from afar, it's a bit looks like a a face with eyes and mouth and um, sometimes he want the face of the module to be uh, symmetrical but then um, the number of parameter I have thought uh, is not symmetrical or sometimes uh, the module has nine uh, CV input and outputs so we can you c we cannot do two rows of five and uh, because I want uh, also the module to look uh, beautiful um, it's common for me to add uh, inputs or outputs or parameters just to make the thing uh, symmetrical. <laughs> yeah. How much does your uh, how, how much does Hannes know about like musical instruments and uh, he, the, the, the the concepts of the parameters? And oh, he's is also um, he, he also performs music. Okay. He has a modular system, right. everything. In fact, uh, he used to be one of my customers because uh, before making uh, modules, I was doing uh, yeah. DIY kits, and uh, he was a customer of my uh, DIY kits. And uh, I'm going to talk now about some uh, pitfalls in uh, user interface design. So this is the first uh, mock-up we came up with for the shades module. Uh, in, two in two dimensions, it looked great. And then uh, we built it, and we thought that it was a bit difficult to access the switch uh, between the knobs. So now uh, we try to build a 3D mock-up, even if it's just a piece of cardboard with uh, knobs glued to it, but just to get a physical idea of the module. Because sometimes something looks very pretty in Illustrator, but it's not a good idea. And um, so now I'm going to talk about the design of the uh, ears module. So on the left, this is the original thing uh, from uh, Music Thing. So this used to be a DIY kit, uh, an open source module uh, made by um, uh, a guy in the UK. And I really love the module because it uh, interacted well with rings. So I wanted to sell my uh, own version of it. And uh, so the first thing we did was just to keep uh, the same layout with the knob and the uh, CV outputs at the bottom. But then we realized that it was more difficult to play on the surface because the knob was getting in the way. So we just uh, reversed everything. And um, then uh, maybe I will show you an example. So we, we first we used this uh, very beautiful uh, flower-like uh, design. Uh, but uh, there is one thing you can do with ears. You take uh, like uh, a guitar pick or whatever. And it was not possible to do this uh, with the flower. Or uh, just maybe we can 
listen to it directly. And uh, we uh, got back to the original design with a spiral, uh, just because uh, doing this was kind of interesting. And it's a bit of a, it's like a playing <laughs> technique. It's like making a guitar, but uh, we can play it in a certain way. So because people uh, learn all these tricks with the original module, uh, it was important for us to uh, bring it back also in uh, our version of it. OK, so now I'll talk about prototyping. So uh, lack of prototyping, because I really suck with my hands. And I don't like uh, building things myself, so um, I'm a bit ashamed of that. But what I do, basically, that uh, I have this uh, magical Python program, which uh, <laughs> takes uh, the um, uh, Eagle file, so like the uh, uh, circuit layout files, and produce uh, an Excel uh, spreadsheet with all the references for the parts, uh, where to buy it. And I upload all this shit to um, um, uh, Beta Layout. So they are in uh, Germany. Basically, I send them all the files, what you have to buy, everything. Uh, I give them uh, a bit of money. And they send me uh, the board already made and everything. And what is really good is that uh, at the beginning, I was uh, still building my prototypes myself. So then you build a prototype, and it doesn't work. So there are two hypotheses. Either I've made a mistake in my design, or I've made a mistake in building the board. And sometimes it takes two, three, four days, an entire week, just to decide which of these two hypotheses is true. And um, these guys, better lay out, they do everything with machines. So when you receive the board, and if it doesn't work, you know that uh, the one to blame is your design. It's not them. And also uh, for the uh, faceplate, uh, we directly um, have them manufactured uh, by the same company uh, who does them in uh, production. So they just need an Illustrator file and a technical drawing. So I just uh, send them this. I have the boards made by Beta Layout. I have the panel made. I put them together. Uh, most of the time it works. And uh, at this point, what you get, I mean, I could uh, just uh, uh, send it to uh, Schneider Sladen, and you would happily uh, pay money for it, because it's uh, almost like uh, the finished product. But to me, uh, this is not where I stop. So what is the difference between what I have at this stage and uh, what you get when you actually buy my product? This is what we're going to talk about. So this is what I call the uh, validation or uh, testing phase. So the first thing, um, do you recognize that? Yeah, so this is an episode of uh, Black Mirror called uh, Playtest. Uh, and this is the, um, the, the name I give to this procedure, really, the playtest. Um, I patch the module. I use uh, next to it uh, only an oscillator and an LFO. And uh, if I get sucked into a kind of uh, black zone in which time totally flows and then woo, five hours have elapsed, I know that the module is good. And if the thing does not happen, it probably means that something is wrong. Like For example, during the development of clouds, uh, the original purpose of the module was uh, what is called now the spectral madness mode. But uh, I could not find this uh, magic with the module. Only when I implemented uh, what is now the uh, primary function of the module, the granular processing, I mean, I didn't even need um, LFO just wiggling the knobs, everything. The first time I got like, clouds running, OK, I knew that there was something with this module. Similar thing with rings, similar thing with breads. I mean, every time I get totally sucked in in a kind of space created by the module. And when this happens, I know that uh, it's good. Um, then I will talk about uh, beta testing. <laughs> so, so you know those guys, yeah. OK, so um, 
every once in a while, uh, someone sends me an email asking me, yeah, I want to be a beta tester for your modules. So here is the truth. There is only one person able to find serious bugs on my module, and it works for <laughs> this uh, company or association. So, um, so the reason for that uh, is twofold. The first one is that I tend to be uh, thorough in my development, so usually there are not so many obvious bugs in the module. The second one is that finding bugs, it's a very special mindset. It's like being a detective or being a hacker. It's not something uh, everybody can do. And um, really, the only person who has given me valuable feedback is a German guy who is obsessed with uh, testing. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the thing about Richard Devine, so uh, Richard Devine sometimes gets uh, beta units of the module, but his feedback is strange because even if the module is totally uh, buggy and uh, shitty and doesn't work as intended, he will still be able to turn it into a track and the kind of music he usually does. So it's not the best feedback you can get from a beta tester. And I would also like to talk about a third kind of feedback I get from tester, which is, yeah, I absolutely love the module, but you should add a button to do this. And it turned out that um, this button does something absolutely specific to the kind of music uh, the tester is uh, doing with the module, and it would not be uh, possible to uh, translate it. Because if I listen to all the beta testers, there would be 10 buttons on the module adding little tweaks or little exceptions to uh, make the module more suitable to everyone test. So you have to accept that uh, for every person, the module will do maybe 90% or 95% of what they need. And if you want to get 100%, well, you have to start building uh, custom-made modules. Uh, now I'm going to talk about robustness. So uh, I torture the module. Uh, there are different kinds of torture, so hardware torture. Uh, I have a couple of um, uh, random modules from DOP first. I just uh, connect uh, the output to all the inputs of my modules and leave it running for a while just to uh, uh, detect uh, bugs or uh, sometimes um, uh, glitches in the audio. Uh, I also uh, try checking that connecting the output of a module to the output of my module won't cause any shortcut. I checked for reverse polarity protection. There is protection in my modules. And also, I put the module in a rack. Uh, I put blind panels everywhere to keep the heat inside. And I leave the module powered for one week just to uh, check that the module won't get damaged just because of the heat. Um, I also do uh, what I call the uh, Gremlins uh, test. So because, uh, uh, as you've seen before, uh, the module exists as uh, C++ code I can put in any kind of environment, I put the module in a virt virtual environment in which uh, very angry Gremlins are turning the knobs, uh, in uh, wingling the knobs in all possible configuration for hours, and I let this program run for hours and hours. It's a way of uh, catching bugs. And then um, I spend uh, one day at the lab uh, to do a couple of tests. The first one is to use um, this kind of guns. So it's, uh, it's sending uh, 4,000 kilovolts uh, to the uh, metallic part of the module. Basically, it's what happens uh, when you have uh, carpets on your floor and you wear uh, wool uh, sweaters. You walk on the carpet and then you touch a module. It will send some static electricity. So I do a simulation of that with the ESD gun just to check that uh, the module won't be damaged. And I also um, do all this um, test in which uh, basically we check that uh, the module uh, won't cause interferences with uh, radio receivers. Also, if you live near uh, like a, a TV tower, you won't get interferences back in your module. Yep. Uh, how do you deal with this crazy amount of data that you get from the software gremlins or the random inputs? Sorry? How do you, how do you spot the glitches in your 
uh, when you uh, read like, the software gremlins, what you call it? I'm not checking for glitches. I just, I'm just checking for crashes. Ah, crashes, hard fault. And also, I monitor the um, uh, CPU use. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, then there is also this step that I call uh, balancing. So uh, what is balancing? It's the thing that when you turn a knob, something interesting uh, must um, occur over the trajectory of the knob. It's not like uh, for the entire half of the knob, there are not so many changing changes in the sound, and then all the interesting stuff happens only in the second half of the knob. So I'm trying to stretch and spread things so that the space of interesting sound is uh, well distributed over the course of the knob. So for analog module, you have to do that during R&D, because you really you control that with the circuit itself. With digital module, uh, it's something that you can correct in software. So I do it at a later stage. And uh, I have uh, one technique, which I call the random sample test. So I um, ask my C++ program to generate 100 uh, samples corresponding to 100 random position of the knob. And I listen to uh, these audio clips. And if most of them are sounding uh, too similar, it means that the module is not well balanced. Uh, so all this, um, it's some kind of creation, uh, but um, I'm okay with it. I mean, it's like uh, maintaining a garden or having your own uh, Japanese garden where you want everything to be uh, pretty. Uh, some people probably dislike my modules because of that, because it's kind of whatever you do, it still sounds uh, nice, but yeah, it's my way of uh, doing things. And then we wait. Uh, what happens is that when I develop a module and when I get it working, it's really uh, exciting. It's like uh, I finish the module, the code works. It's the best thing I've done in my life. I'm so excited. Uh, I just wait for this excitement to dissipate before uh, releasing the module, because uh, I don't think I'm very objective in my judgment uh, right after the module has worked for the first time. So usually um, there is like six or seven months during which uh, the product is just sleeping. And if after six or seven months I still find the excitement, it means that it's good for release. So yeah, time for release. So I will just go uh, quickly on uh, this part. So uh, what do I have to do to manufacture a module? I have to produce basically a large list of files. Uh, one of these files is the X and Y position of each, each component uh, on the module. This is uh, used to control the robot that places the component on the board. Uh, I have to uh, give uh, the um, manufacturer uh, the uh, references for each of the components uh, because they have to uh, by themselves. So yeah, um, we usually say that uh, such or such brand is a uh, Eurorack manufacturer, but in fact I'm not a manufacturer because there are no machines uh, in my uh, workshop. Uh, a couple of hours ago I visited the uh, workshop of uh, Mark Verbos and in fact he can say that he is a manufacturer because uh, he owns uh, the machine. But uh, in my case, I don't have any machine. Everything is done by a manufacturing uh, company in the west of France. And I just have to uh, give them all those files uh, describing the module. And they build everything for me. And what I receive uh, from them is really the module in a box. So it's uh, I don't have to do anything. I just. Uh, put stacks on it in cardboard boxes that I ship to uh, Schneiders and their friends, or their enemies. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's uh, the only uh, manufacturing that I do. Um, yeah, so uh, you can see that this is a, a copy of the um, uh, quote sent by manufacturer. And you can see that there is a column for 24 and the colon for uh, 228 to 252. It means that every time I release a new module, I first do a small batch of 24. And when these modules are made, I'm present at the factory. 
and if everything goes well, uh, we continue with the rest. But uh, usually, I don't immediately uh, ramp up to uh, 250 or 500 units. I do this uh, small run uh, because sometimes there are uh, mistakes, and it's much easier to correct a mistake on 24 units than to do it on uh, 240 units, especially when they have been dispatched uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I send my order to the manufacturer. So you can see that uh, there are lines for the uh, modules themselves, and also uh, there are some there is some tooling, uh, and it's uh, some cost you have to pay every time you modify a file uh, in the module. And uh, yeah, so this cost is for the uh, module, but not the knobs, uh, faceplate, boxes, everything. Uh, because this is something I ship separately to the manufacturer. So every time I, um, I want to launch a new batch of module, I send an order to the manufacturer, and then I shop for the manual, faceplate, boxes, knobs, potentiometers, all the things that are uh, made to order, that are specific to my brand, and I have all this stuff uh, shipped to the <coughs> manufacturer. Uh, so I have this uh, video, you can find it on the Mutable Instruments site, which is a video of the factory in which you can see all the steps in the manufacturing process. I will just uh, skip that. So yeah, uh, quality. So basically the manufacturer has made a module and uh, before putting it in the box and uh, shipping to, uh, to me and then to Schneider and then to you, uh, we need to know whether the module will work or not. Um, so the way I'm doing is that for each module now, uh, you have a board like this. Uh, you uh, snap the module on this board, and uh, you have a piece of uh, software running on Linux. And uh, so I call it a Module Hero because it's like playing uh, Guitar Hero. Um, you have to uh, so on the screen you see a knob moving, and you move the knob. You do the same, and the module just check that. Uh, uh, the module, um, the knob is working as expected. So the people at the factory are just uh, like following the instruction for this knob and, and so on, and the software is checking that the module is doing the right thing. And for a module like Platz, it means that we can test uh, every knob, every sieve input, and every output in two minutes. And this is why uh, it's uh, much cheaper than braids. Because on Braille, the test procedure was not like that. Uh, it took 10 minutes to uh, test a module. So this drastic reduction in the test time is why the module is uh, much cheaper. Yeah, release time. So um, people often ask me, what are your two favorite uh, mutable instrument products? So I can say, yeah, it's rings and it's ties but it's not the right answer. Uh, my first uh, favorite product is something called the Module Tester. Some of it might have seen it on the uh, Mutable Instrument side. So basically, it's a box. You can plug a module on it, and it, this box has also uh, LFO, uh, oscillators, and uh, something to check the pitch of a note. And it's really useful for the development of the module. And my uh, second favorite uh, mutable instrument product is uh, boxes. So this is my uh, uh, like business management uh, software. Uh, it's uh, keeping track of the uh, uh, reservations, uh, inventory, uh, uh, generating some info for my accountant and so on, and uh, it can also automatically print uh, shipping labels for DHL, this kind of stuff. Uh, so this is actually why I can be alone and uh, run my uh, business uh, without uh, having more employees, because uh, all this stuff is automated in uh, boxes. Yeah, reception. So now the module has been uh, put to market. Uh, let's see what people are thinking about it. So, do you recognize this guy? No one? Oh, he's uh, Umberto Eco. And, um, <laughs> and uh, he came up with uh, this idea of uh, aberrant decoding, so obviously in his research in uh, semiotics. Uh, it's the idea that uh, sometimes uh, works of uh, art or literature 
can uh, get a totally different meaning than what the author wanted to convey with it. And in fact, uh, there is some aberrant uh, decoding in my modules. So for example, in the case of clouds, uh, many people are using it as a kind of end of chain FX or as a reverb but this was not really my intention of the module. I put a reverb in the module because uh, it was very similar to what you get when you increase uh, the number of grain. So like if you take the, uh, uh, if you take the sound you get with n grains and you take n to the limit, to the infinite, what you get is similar to a reverb. So this is why I put a reverb on clouds, because it was a way of faking uh, infinite grains. But people are just using as an end of chain FX. Uh, in, the kind of, in the case of rings, uh, people often tell me that, yeah, it's always sounding the same. This is because they don't use the uh, internal, uh, I mean, they only use the internal exciter. But once you start uh, using it to process uh, drums or sounds recording by uh, contact microphone or field recordings. Uh, it's really uh, enlarged the sound palette of the module. Um, yeah, this one is interesting. Like, uh, there are many people in Murphy Gler convinced that Pix was uh, doing sample playback. And it's because on the website, I said that the module is working at uh, 44 kilohertz, 16 bits. So they assumed, yeah, OK, so it means that the module is playing sample. But it was doing uh, some kind of VA uh, modeling. Um, in the case of tides, uh, so this is a module that can be used at an envelope or LFO. So people talk about it like uh, multi-mode module, but it's not the case because the module uh, is using the same code for the envelope and LFO. It's just that at the end of the envelope, it stops. And at the end, when you use it as an LFO, it just loops on itself. So from my point of view, the module is doing one thing because there is only one block of code. But to people, it's uh, two different things. And uh, yeah, and there is this word that I absolutely hate. Yeah menu diving, like, do you put on your <laughs> scuba mask to <laughs> go diving in the menu? Uh, <laughs> I just, I don't know, it sounds silly to me. And yeah, the last step, retirement. So <laughs> some people uh, remember this uh, Facebook post uh, where I announced that clouds would be uh, discontinued. So yeah, sometimes um, I realized that I could have done things better so um, I start working on the replacement, and there is usually a point uh, at which it feels morally wrong to continue selling the old version of the module, because I already have uh, created enough of the next version to realize that it should be a big improvement, so I want to stop. I'm not doing a kind of switch from one version to the next or a crossfade. It's really I stop with the old version, and then I wait for the next version to, to be ready. But that's my way of uh, making my products evolve. And yeah, there is nothing after retirement. <laughs> Eternal life, because it's open source. So <laughs> even if I die, some people can continue letting it live. Thank you very much.